So let us pray. Loving God, in this time that we have to reflect and meditate on your words to us, we ask for clear minds, open hearts, spirits that are ready and waiting to hear you today. If there are words that bring us challenge, Help us to sit patiently with them. If there are words that trigger us, help us to trust that we are not alone. And for those words that bring us joy and encouragement, may they sit within us and spur us to transformation. May there be more of you, God, and less of me. In the name of Christ. Amen. So what does it mean to live as people of the resurrection? Before Easter, we know ourselves as followers of Jesus. We follow the one who went before us, healing the blind and the lame, fellowshipping with the unclean, and outcast of society and speaking out against the injustices and oppression of the Roman and the temple authorities. In the time leading up to Jesus' death, Jesus' life showed us how we could live a life different to what the world around us offers. Through his interactions with people, Jesus gave us examples of a life that was based on grace, love and forgiveness over and against a life based on greed, selfishness, and fear. But with the resurrection comes a change. Things are different now. Things should be different now. Through the cross, Jesus becomes the Christ, the chosen one, conqueror of the grave, defeater of death, His time on earth is coming to an end. And so like the disciples on this side of the cross and the resurrection, we are faced with that same question, what now? What does this resurrected life look like? And as we've just heard in Luke's gospel reading for today, at this point, For the disciples, it seems a resurrected life is full of fear and doubt. And if you read a little bit earlier to the reading for today, Luke tells us that even at the the day of resurrection, the women who went to the tomb were perplexed by the two figures telling them Jesus wasn't there anymore. And then Peter didn't believe their story about Jesus being alive, and so he had to go and check it out for himself. And then two of the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus and don't even recognize Jesus walking with them until they sit down to eat together. And so now in today's reading, we hear that Jesus the Christ appears among the gathered disciples and they immediately think he is a ghost. It's not until He shows them his hands and his feet. Do they finally accept the earthiness, the realness of Christ's presence? He comes not as a ghost, but with flesh and bones. And not only that, he asks them for something to eat. This is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, conqueror of the grave and death itself. And he is hungry. And I wonder if what Luke is showing us is the profound paradox of the resurrection, that not only does God choose to limit God's self by becoming human in the first place and to live a limited human life in order to show us an example of a different life, but Christ who couldn't be held down by death chooses again to come to this rough band of flawed and fearful followers to have dinner with them. And then at the same time, 
amidst their fear, their doubt, to issue an invitation to them to live in such a way that they are witnesses to Christ's resurrection over the power of death and destruction. There is something very confronting about Luke's retelling, Luke's telling of the story, because it brings us face to face with the reality of the kingdom of God that Jesus preached, that it is not just about an eternal life waiting ahead for us, but rather it is about the life we live now having eternal significance. If the risen Christ himself is found behind locked doors, sharing the food, the fish, the hospitality of a group of doubting, sinful, confused, fearful people, then maybe that is precisely where those who claim to be Christ followers must always also find themselves. Luke teaches us that an honest and authentic faith inherently leads us into the earthiness of life because it is there that we experience Christ's presence as a glimpse of eternal life in the now and in the not yet, the time to come, where we can find peace right in the midst of the messy suffering and hope in the midst of the doubt and fear and chaos. And I have to say, even just as I have shared that, after hearing the news last night of those who have been uh, killed in the shopping centre in Bondi Junction, let alone the ongoing news that we hear in places around the world, it is a big challenge for us to consider what it means to be able to imagine peace in the midst of the earthy, raw and real suffering of this world. So let's be honest, sitting with the earthiness of life is not particularly pleasant. Wouldn't we have rather Jesus had returned to his disciples in a blazing shower of glory, surrounded by all the angels? Because it's hard enough being real with our own messy, authentic selves, let alone being willing to get involved in the messiness of others' lives. And so sometimes it can be easier to choose to mask our true selves or to sanitise our interactions with others or even turn the TV off so that we don't have to deal with the chaos and the mess that is often difficult and ugly to face. So what then is the witness that we are presenting to the world around us? Because Christ didn't say, when you are ready, you will be my witnesses. Or you you could be my witnesses if you do such and such and such and such. Or if you choose, you can be a witness. Christ said, you are my witnesses to these things. Regardless of whether we choose or not, Our way of being in the world is itself a witness to the resurrection of Christ. The earthy, messy, ugly reality that we need to grapple with in this time post-Easter, in the season of Easter, is that both joy and grace are a witness, as is fear and pride and ignorance. Generosity and hope are a witness, as is arrogance and greed. Kindness and gentleness and forgiveness are a witness, as is selfishness, deceit and control. 
what we are a witness to in our earthly, daily lives is what the community around us sees and understands. And yet, despite this, for some unknown reason, the God of creation has chosen still to rely on us, on those disciples, on all, anyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ. God has chosen on us to be God's witnesses to the resurrection. Not a great PR strategy on God's part, you'd have to say, and yet it is a reflection of God's audacity that we are worth relying on. Back in the 80s and 90s, when I was a young adult Christian, I found myself in a uniting church community in North Queensland that my dear friend Graham will know very, very well. This community was deeply connected into what would be considered the more evangelical, capital E, evangelical and charismatic movement of the day. It was a wonderful and life-giving time of my faith journey within the Uniting Church, where my Methodist roots, that enc where they encouraged a deeply personal faith in Jesus, and they went into overdrive. It was a time of faith healings. It was a time of speaking in tongues. It was a time of watching the movement of God's spirit among us all as we innocently stretched our understanding and our experience of God's mystery and wonder and spirituality. In that time, there was a particular figure, a man named Bill Hybels, who was the founder of the Willow Creek Community Church in Illinois in the US, he was becoming a world guru in bringing people to Jesus, in growing the church. He became, for many of us, a father of the faith, inspiring countless exciting local church activities. We had cafe churches going every way. We saw healings. We did all sorts of fun things and some a little weird as I look back. But they were all doing it for Jesus, so it was all good. We saw a multitude of young people particularly coming to faith. Willow Creek and Bill Hybel's influence across the world was incredible. And one of the most memorable, memorable books he wrote, it was entitled, Who You Are When No One Is Looking?, it played a really important part in the growth of my faith and leadership as a young adult. It tapped into my deepest values of integrity and authenticity and challenged me personally about what it means to be a person of ethical character such that I am the same regardless of whether I am in a community of people or by myself when no one is around. And to this day, I've realised that what Hybels was espousing has been at the core of how I've tried, not sometimes without success, but how I've tried to live out my faith every day. And it means it's also been a thorn in my side on those days when my character has been less than I would aspire it to be. Hybels even brought out an updated edition of this world groundbreaking book in 2010 with an additional chapter entitled World Change When Character Counts Most. He said, when I listen to the evening news or read the morning paper these days, my reaction is always the same. What's wrong in our world will not be set right until people who love God and who refuse to cave to these overwhelming challenges, put the things they believe into action, things like courage and discipline and love. It's as Christ said to his disciples, you are my witnesses to these things. Excuse me for a moment. 
However, our witness to Christ's way of being in the world can be either life-giving to those around us or it can be life-destroying. And sadly for Bill Hybels, a few years after this book was republished, he found himself facing a multiple, allegation, multiple allegations of sexual misconduct that had gone on for many years with many different women. And since 2018, stories have continued to emerge not only about how Hybels mistreated women, but how he also responded in everyday situations, exploding with anger and frustration at the slightest provocation. And further compounding this spiralling disgrace has been watching his church's response in the very beginning over time in how they have not perhaps held the same level of accountability to him that he preached about in his books. Following an independent investigation, it was found that the allegations were substantive and that looking back over Heibel's behaviour, it was clear how he had put himself and others at risk time and again. By 2019, Heibel's had stepped down from his leadership position leaving in his wake a litany of victims who will continue to suffer for the rest of their lives. A broken and traumatised church trying to be rebuilt, and not to mention shocking and deeply disappointing those of us who have ever been encouraged by his prior teaching and leadership. Such is the significance of the witness we are to the world on behalf of Christ. As one of his victims has lamented, how could he have done all this good when there were such dark things happening behind the scenes? So what now, we ask, in this post-Easter resurrection life? Well, now... We get to work looking for opportunities to live a life with intention and purpose and character that looks different to the world around us. A life in which who we are when no one is looking is the same as if we are in plain sight of the world. We get to work living a life that chooses the way of humility rather than arrogance. Of grace rather than retribution. Of love rather than intolerance. Of a generosity mindset rather than a scarcity mindset and of a faith in the God who made us and knows us rather than the faith in ourselves or in the security that we build up around us or in the borders we try to erect to keep us safe or in the hope that wealth and education or status will bring us fulfilment. You see, it's as we participate in the mundane, ordinary stuff of life as we eat broiled fish with one another, as we live into our questions and our doubts instead of running away from them, as we live as though no one is looking at us, then we are witnesses to God's story of hope and everlasting life for all the world. Jesus the Christ is relying on us to do this for the sake of a broken world in need of reconciliation. Friends, today you are acknowledging the end of Mel's time of service with you. 
Mel, if there is one thing that I could say on behalf of the church to you for your witness in this place, it is well done, good and faithful servant. The call of ministry is a call to a deep and abiding witness to and for Christ within a community. And it is a tough gig. And it requires a heap of imagination in the midst of the earthy reality of a community's daily human lives. Like all ministers, Mel, you will have had moments of joy and wonder at being part of what God has been doing here. And you will have had moments of grief and disappointment at your own failings and at the failings of those around you. All of that needs to be named and owned as part of what it means to witness to and for Christ in this place because it is the cost of being human with one another. And yet through it all, God has been faithful and is faithful to you and to the Albert Street congregation. Because as you have participated in the sharing of life and faith together, of messy moments, you have been and you are a continuing witness to that longing within all people to know God more, to know that there is something that exists beyond what we see around us and to share that faith with one another along the way. And that is all that is asked of you, all that is asked of any of us. And somehow, in both our strengths and in our weaknesses, in fact, mostly in our weaknesses, God is at work bringing just a little more hope and healing and reconciliation into the world. That's what it means to live as people of the resurrection. Honesty, authenticity and willingness to live with the mess and the chaos of one another's lives. So as you both prepare to end your time together, know that the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Rahab, of Judas, of Mary, of Zacchaeus, of Mother Teresa, and even of Albert Street's first Methodist minister, Reverend William Moore, that God has already gone ahead of you to prepare Mel and the congregation for where God is leading you next. You are witnesses to the risen Christ. So may God continue to transform that witness as you walk different paths of faith with the same re resurrected Christ. May your witness be a glimpse of heaven. Amen. Let us pray. God, as we enter in this time of sharing in this familiar meal together, as we prepare to mark the closure of this particular season in the congregation and Mel's faith journey, we are reminded, God, that it is our witness it is the example that each one of us presents to the world. Whether people see it or not, that is a witness to your resurrected glory. God, challenge us today with those parts of our lives, our behaviours, our attitudes, that we know are witnessing to something other than a resurrected life. By your grace, God, forgive those things and help us 
to practice a different way of being in the world. Help us to live as people of the resurrection. In the name of Christ. Amen.